faith in ways that you don't even know. Pastor Marty said it best. Uh, your servant's heart is in many ways unmatched. And so I'm grateful, very grateful for you. Uh, my family is grateful for you. Um, so I'm glad we got to participate in that moment together. How many of you are uh, hoping for snow tonight? Yeah? That was, that's only a handful of people. All right. Um, I, I kind of want some snow. Pastor, as a, as a pastor, he's probably thinking, I don't want snow. I want to have some, I want church tomorrow, right? Um, I came, I, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the world we live in. We can have it online. Um, I saw an article this week that highlighted the 20 inches of snow Raleigh got back in 2000. Uh, who is here for that? Anybody? All right. That's quite a few hands. Probably more than I thought. Um, some of y'all probably didn't even live in Raleigh then. I came to Raleigh in 2002. Uh, so just mi missed that, but man, 20 inches of snow. I would love to see that again. Um, I'm afraid tonight we're not going to see that, but perhaps one day. Uh, we're going to dive right in, church. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, you can be turning to Matthew chapter 5. Um, as the pastor said, we're back in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, a series that we started a few weeks ago, calling it a countercultural life, a countercultural life. And the reason we're calling it that is because when followers of Jesus embody these teachings, right, when we conform ourselves to the character of Christ, we look different. We look different. We are different than the culture around us, which then makes us countercultural. Now, the difference here, church, ultimately is not that we are people who simply oppose culture, and that's why we look different, but we are more so different because we have conformed to another culture, we are citizens of another kingdom. And because of that, we look different in the culture that we live in. Uh, can I use Buddy the Elf as an example? All right, he's the best example of someone who doesn't fit in and does not care. Right? I always think it's funny when Buddy the Elf, you know, every Christmas we watch this movie, he comes to New York and he flat out uh, does not fit in with culture around him. He's eating gum off of the, the railings. Grosses me out even thinking about it. Uh, he's, he's playing hopscotch on the crosswalk he's pushing all the buttons in the elevator he sticks out man he doesn't understand that culture that society at all the question for us church is are we are we ready and are we willing to look different to stand out in character in deed in word in speech in truth are we ready to be set apart as a countercultural community in a culture that largely is antithetical to the gospel Remember, week one, when we started this, we said our goal is to be able to go through this whole sermon, Matthew 5 through 7, and walk away at the end looking like citizens of heaven, being a people that are recognizably different, not as products of culture, but as children of God. All right, and so we're going to continue in this sermon tonight. Uh, in fact, we're going to start back up in verse 17. And just read 17 through 20. That was the uh, passage last week. But we're just going to read it together because it sets the stage for us as we dive in uh, to anger, lust, and divorce. All right, a little lighthearted sermon for you this evening. But look at uh, verse 17 with me, okay? Let's read together. Jesus says here, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. All right, that's an important statement, as countercultural as Jesus is. He didn't come to stand in opposition to the Old Covenant uh, or to undermine the Old Covenant. Right? He's not here to bend the rules. He's completing the Old Covenant. He is fulfilling it. We talked about that in Hebrews a lot, remember? Verse 18, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, the smallest stroke of the pen, the smallest letter in the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that last part is an important, that last verse is important as it sets the stage for the next six topics that he has. It's quite the ridiculous statement, isn't it? Our righteousness needs to exceed the professional Christians, right? It was a, a laughable statement even. 
It would be like me saying, hey guys, I'm, I'm going to form a flag football team for recreational purposes on the weekends. Who wants to play? But, but if you want to be my quarterback, you've got to be better than Tom Brady. Right? You'd say, ha ha. Like, that's unthinkable. And, and the statement here has the same effect. Jesus is looking around and saying, your righteousness needs to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees, which is impossible. Unless, unless Jesus is leading us somewhere deeper. In fact, he wants to focus not on what they're doing, but what, on, what they're missing. He's aiming now for the heart. The righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees has to do with the heart. So in the rest of chapter 5, he covers these six different topics, we'll call them. And tonight we'll look at the first three, anger, lust, and divorce, all right? So let's begin there in verse 21 and read together. He says, Jesus says, you've heard it said, or you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. Pause right there. So are you tracking with what he's saying? I mean, this is a pretty extreme statement, especially if this is your first time hearing this sermon. In a nutshell, let's condense it down. Jesus is saying here, ultimately... That just because you have not murdered someone, you are not morally better than someone who has murdered someone. Our tendency is to compare, right? Well, I haven't done what that guy did, or I'm better because I haven't messed up like that guy did. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 you're actually a lot more alike than you think, right? Because ultimately, murder is the result of the internal sin, Internal anger leads to external violence when it, leads, when it reaches its full potential. 1 John 3, 15, you know, agrees with this. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So Jesus here is taking our eyes off of the result of the sin that allows us to stand at a distance and say, I'm, I'm not like him. Thank God I didn't do that. I'm better because X, Y, and Z. And he's pointing our eyes then to our own hearts for examination purposes, which then says, oh, I'm a lot more like that guy than I thought. And when we begin to make this connection, the connection that sees that other people's sin finds its roots in the same seeds that dwell in us, two things happen. One our compassion for the lost grows immensely. Because instead of looking at others who think differently and look differently as enemy, we begin to see them as image bearers who need the same grace that God has given us. And the other thing is that it elevates the gospel. It becomes all the more precious because when we're truly faced with the reality that our internal anger makes us more like a murderer than it does like a saint, then we are overwhelmed with helplessness. If this is true, then you and I are utterly helpless unless someone else intervenes, unless there is a righteousness that we can obtain not by our own merit and our own achievement. Right, This sermon ultimately is not about you going and doing better and becoming a better version of yourself. Ultimately, it's about surrendering to Jesus and allowing his righteousness to be yours. Now, let's ask the obvious question here about anger. Are Christians just never supposed to be angry? I've met these Christians. They baffle me. They always have smiles on their faces. And I don't trust them because there are times where they should be angry and they're not. Of course there are times that we should be angry. But then again, the Bible says many, on many occasions uh, that you should suppress your anger, right? Psalm 37, 8 says, refrain from anger, give up your rage. Right? James 1, 20, the anger of man doesn't produce what? The righteousness of God. And there are countless other verses that warn against this kind of anger. But this anger that the Bible's addressing in this context is the anger that develops out of our own personal ego. It is an anger that is primarily concerned with an offense against 
your pride. It's a selfish anger. It's an it's a unrighteous anger. It is concerned ultimately about your reputation. But a righteous anger, a righteous anger is a biblical anger. It is an anger that hates the things God hates and is angry at the things that anger God. Like abortion, racism, death itself. We can be angry at those things. God is against those things. But here's where it gets tricky, church. We can easily cross that line of righteous anger, biblical anger, to this place of unrighteous anger when we allow said issue to become our identity to the point where we are actually defending ourselves and no longer actually standing for truth. Do you see the difference? One has been, we take on this identity that it is our job to defend X, Y, and Z. And that breeds an anger that comes from our pride. But Jesus is saying, be a city on a hill. Stand for truth. Don't get caught up in making this personal. This is about the kingdom. Be salt and light. Be a lamp in a dark room. This is what ultimately can lead to an us versus them mentality rather than a we were them mentality. Let me read the verse that led to my wife's conversion in college. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul reminds us, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? To which my good Catholic wife would have said, yes, that's right. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, uh, the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers uh, will inherit the kingdom of God. To which she said, that's right, they won't. Verse 11, this is when the Spirit struck her, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. If our anger is building walls between those who have the gospel and those who need it, that is an anger that is driven by a pride and an ego. Our anger is should exploit wickedness and bring grace for the purpose of redemption. Keep going. In verse 23, Jesus continues. He says, If you're offering your gift at the altar and there, are, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and, and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Again, a condition of the heart is of primary importance. You can give a million dollars a year to the church, but if you hate the guy three pews in front of you, you're missing the heart of who our God is. He is more concerned about reconciling and redemption and forgiveness than he is about what you can bring. Verse 24, or 25. Come to terms quickly, he says, with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. So he paints a legal scene here, right? I was talking to my friend the other week who is a lawyer, and sometimes he deals with churches and certain lawsuits. And these were his words to me. He said, man, I hate dealing with churches. <laughs> it's funny because we know why, right? And he said, I quote, they're the most bitter people I've ever met. And I wanted to defend myself. I wanted to defend the church. He wasn't talking about our church. But part of me knew exactly what he was talking about. And it broke my heart. And it should break all of our hearts to hear that we are called to be one thing, but our reputation, for whatever reason, is a completely different thing. That's tragic. I desperately pray that the heart of Christ would penetrate the hardened hearts of those in the church, myself included. He moves to lust in verse 27, right? He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So he moves from the sixth commandment to the seventh commandment. 
Notice also, he's all, always starting these off by saying, you've heard it said, but I'm saying this. Again, he's not undermining what the old covenant says, what the law says. He's not saying, it says this, but I'm going to bend it a little bit. He's saying, listen, you've heard it t- taught this way. So he's calling into question the interpretation of the rabbis, right? Like, many of you guys have heard that there were three wise men at Jesus' birth, right? Because we say it, don't we? But the Bible never says it. We just kind of started saying that because there's three gifts, you know, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Bible doesn't say that. There's probably lots of them. But you've heard that, right? So he's saying, you guys have heard this, but let me give you the, the accurate interpretation of what the law is meant to do. So he says in verse 28, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better uh, that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So just like the action of murder and internal anger are connected. Jesus, again, is now connecting the act of adultery with internal inward lust. Right? Again, reminding us, righteousness, Christianity is not about just external behavior. It's about internal character. You've probably heard the phrase, sex sells. Right? Meaning that any product advertised that appeals to your sexual desire will do better than products that don't. That's not speculation. That is fact. That is proven. That is research proven. All right? You might remember the Hardee's commercials. They decided to put a sexy woman in a commercial about a hamburger. And it worked. Sales skyrocketed because it appealed to our sexual drive. Right? Or, or you maybe have seen the Axe body spray commercials where it depicts young men putting... Axe body spray on. And because of that, beautiful women cannot resist them. In fact, it draws beautiful women toward them. Is Will Britton here? That's a lie if he's in here. Like, young men, that doesn't work. I tried it in high school. It didn't work then either. All right? But here's the thing. Advertisers understand the power of lust. And they use it against you. Jesus understands the power of lust. And he warns us about it. Because it's not something to play with. Look at the consequences. It's deadly. It is ultimately destructive. Now, sexual desire in in the right context, within the confines of marriage between a husband and a wife, is a good thing. But when it begins to creep outside of that territory that God designed and go into a realm where it is forbidden, that's called sin. This is what happened in the garden, right? Uh, eating fruit is not a bad thing. But when you do it, and, and when you do it after God said, do not do this, my perfect, create, my perfect plan is this, and we try to step outside of that, that's called sin. Now let me just clarify this language here, um, because you know I've met guys who, who consider lust something that I don't consider it. They, they feel bad when they walk by a Victoria's Secret store in the mall. You know what I mean? Like not even looking, they just feel dirty. And I get it, it's a, it's a bit extreme. But what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's not saying that the thing that randomly catches your eye is sin. Um, he's not saying that we can't admire beauty. We should, we should admire beauty. Right, but what he is saying is, that lust is a look that is intended to stir up sexual desire. Charles Quarles says it like this. He says, it's a lingering look. He says, the present participle could be translated, everyone who keeps on looking. This is a sensual stare, a lustful gawking. Later on, he says, this lustful look locks eyes on another person, uses him or her to fuel one's sexual imagination. You see the difference? We can be a people who admire beauty and appreciate beauty, but we're not called to be a people who lust after it. You see, our culture wants to make that okay, wants to make lust normal. It takes sex 
lightly. But Jesus takes it very, very seriously. To the point where he says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now my guess is with you know, the amount of folks in this room and maybe those watching online, someone is dealing with sexual sin. And I would encourage you to, to bring that to the light and to confess it. I'm here to walk with you through that. There is grace and there is forgiveness. With that said, you might be thinking, well, is, is Jesus telling me to mutilate my body? How do I interpret this? In the early 200s, uh, church father Origen took this passage literally. He would get naked and roll around in sharp briars to suppress his fleshly desires. Found out that that did not alleviate his lust. So he ended up castrating himself, only later to admit that he had misinterpreted Jesus' teaching. It's not exactly something you can undo. So I'm going to save you a lot of trouble. This is not something we need to interpret literally, but how do we, what is Jesus saying? Well, Jesus is saying, take any measures necessary to kill this sin or it will kill you take seriously the precautions you need to put in place to get this out of your life as a college pastor this was the predominant theme in my ministry i cannot tell you how many conversations i had with guys who would come to me confessing porn addictions and inappropriate relationships and the conversation always had to come to a point where that ended, what do we have to do to kill it? I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that you can go beat this on your own. This week I celebrated with a guy who came to me two years ago, said, I've got a porn problem. So we said, what do we need to do? He used his own money to pay for a monthly subscription for software that goes on his computer, monitors his phone, his computer, sends me a weekly email that monitors all of his content for the sake of accountability. And this week he told me, man, God has really delivered me from this sin, from this addiction. And we rejoiced over that. Whatever measures need to be put in place, let's put them in place. Jesus is saying this is not something to mess with outside of the confines of how God intended it to be used. Divorce, he moves on. Now, you might be thinking, especially if you're hearing this sermon for the first time, you're like, this is random. He's just jumping all over the place, right? Anger, lust, divorce. But this is strategic, man. This is calculated. He's not being random. He's actually showing us how all of these things are united. And he's showing us how the common theme here uh, is the heart. Each of these things find their source and their roots in our heart. So read with me in verse 31. It says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So in those first two we saw, Jesus is explicitly uh, pulling from the Ten Commandments. right? And this one he's referencing Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Laws concerning divorce now in that in those verses there is a phrase that the rabbis really took advantage of in order to justify divorce for whatever reason they wanted to in the passage it says that a man can divorce his wife if he finds some indecency in her your version might say something improper about her so they took that phrase and they really really stretched it I mean, who's to say what's indecent and what's improper? That can mean a lot of different things. So about 100 years after Jesus, a, a book called the Mishnah was composed. It was a collection of Jewish laws. And in this uh, Jewish literature, there were laws about divorce. And you can see how it evolved. It got to the point where divorce was pretty much permissible at any cost. It says things like, if her eyes were too high or too low, you could divorce her. If they were crossed, or if she had no eyelashes, or if they were two different colors, if she had watery eyes, you could divorce her. The man could divorce his wife if her nose was too big or too little, her ears too floppy, if she had an overbite or an underbite, or missing teeth or poor figure, bony ankles or knees. I mean, the list is extensive. I was laughing out loud in my office reading this, but it, and it's really not that funny. It's, it's sad. 
But what happened is that you end up with a Jewish culture where divorce is just rampant and accepted. And the problem with that is that it is not at all a reflection of the covenant that God had made with them. So Jesus comes in and he interprets this properly, encourages us, do not take divorce lightly. If the divorce rate in the church is the same as the divorce rate outside of the church, how does that communicate or what does that communicate about our belief in the power of covenant and the power of reconciliation? Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that divorce is not a part of life and something that happens. If you have been divorced or if you're considering divorce or if you know someone who's been divorced, there's two things to make clear here as I see it in Scripture. One, divorce is, is not a part of God's good intention. So don't come to me and say, I think God is leading me to divorce my spouse. I'll just tell you, that's not from God. That's not, about, that's not uh, a reflection of who he is. It's not a reflection of his covenant. But two, I would also say, and especially to those who have been divorced, uh, to those who feel perhaps um, a, a defeat over your life, I would say that divorce is not uh, the unpardonable sin and it's not something that terminates your salvation. I mentioned abortion earlier, same thing. It is not the unpardonable sin. Both of those things are the result of the reality of a broken and sinful world that we live in. But guess what? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Which means you can walk out of here in victory, in celebration, in hope. You can walk out of here as a child of God. Right now in this Sermon on the Mount, the tension that you should feel is one of complete helplessness, but one of also complete acceptance by God because of what Jesus has done. It is this simultaneous act of sin and justification. It is the gospel at work in you, for you. If you have been a, uh, in a broken relationship, if you have struggled with unrighteous anger, if you have a sexual sin problem where lust is out of control, there is grace. Don't let Satan allow those things to stay in a box and to stay in the dark. Let them out. Bring it to light. Allow the grace of God to pour over you. This is not a place where I will accept shame culture. This is a place where we want to enhance the grace of God at work in our lives. Let's be known for that. Let's not be simply products of our culture. Let's be grace-driven Christians. Let's be children of God at work in our community. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that you, uh, that you love us enough to say hard things. God, we are grateful that you don't uh, avoid difficult topics. God, because we have questions about these things. But Lord, you give us answers. And the unbelievable part is that you know that we can't live up to your standard. Yet, you still accept us and you still love us based on who you are and what Jesus has done. And I pray that that truth would transform us. I pray, God, that that uh, truth would empower us to live lives that follow after you. Lord, I lift up those in here who, who could say, man, I relate too well to those things that Jesus was teaching on. Lord, I pray that you would bring them to a place of confession, repentance, uh, and abundant life. Lord, that you transform their hearts, that you continue to sanctify them, and me included. Father, we need your grace as we continue in this journey, as we continue in this life. We thank you for Jesus, and it is his, in his name we pray. Amen.